we know that 54 low and middle income countries uh, during the pandemic could not invest more in global health, in their health projects, I mean, facing the, the pandemic, because they had to pay their debt to creditors. We also know that if all the debt had be, of the most indebted countries had been you know, released in 2020, 40 billion dollars would have been liberated. They would have been 300 billion dollars if also the debt of 2021, we're talking about the two topical, yeah. you know, peak years for the pandemic had been released. So you can see the, you know, enormous gap between the 10 billion of the World Bank, which are not faintly achieved yet, and the money that could be liberated through debt cancellation. <laughs> Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. As you know, we are covering the executive board meeting of the WHO and bringing you uh, uh, stories, reporting and a lot of perspectives and telling you what's going on really at the EB in Geneva at the WHO headquarters. Today we have with us uh, Nicoletta Dentico. Uh, she is the Global Health Lead of uh, Society for International Development, an Italy-based organization. And she also plays a prominent role in G2H2, which is a short for Geneva Global Health Hub, uh, which is a network of civil society organizations who follow global health governance closely and uh, talk about it and do the do real activism uh, to ensure that there is more democracy within the global health governance arena. So welcome, Nicoletta. Thank you very and, much. Uh, so today we are going to talk about health emergencies, and this is one of the major topics which is being discussed uh, um, at the EB this time, which will also be discussed uh, in the World Health Assembly. And in between, there will be some meetings. Um, so as we all know that it has become the issue of the day to talk about, uh, primarily because of the COVID-19 and the pandemic and uh, what we saw uh, uh, as people of the world, the way things unfolded. So it is recently on 31st of January uh, that uh, uh, marked three years of COVID-19 be declared as a public health emergency of international concern. Um, so, but what we need to see is that, are we really responding uh, uh, to the future crisis and the current crisis uh, with those learnings or are we really working as business as usual? So uh, coming to what is happening exactly at the EB, so the Director General has produced the report uh, which is for global architecture of health emergencies, which will fall under the larger umbrella of pandemic treaty, which is being discussed at the WHO. There are 10 proposals that the DG Tedros makes in that. Um, so uh, what would you say, what are those proposals and what are the kind of contradictions uh, that the proposals within themselves have? Uh, of course, uh, the WHO emergency agenda, which has developed over the last two years and which has had a huge boost after the Ebola crisis, because we shouldn't forget that this has been a turning point for the emergency, for the emergency agenda of the WHO and also for the restructuring of the WHO and its sense of purpose, so to speak, is, as we speak, the topic of the discussion at the, the EB, as you said, is the main uh, chapter of this uh, complex agenda. Uh, in the 75th year uh, of the of the World Health Organization itself, so it, there are lots of lots of interesting coincidences, as well as the one you mentioned, that this is the third year of the declaration of the uh, public health emergency of international concern. A lot of documents. Maybe we should also look at the two lines of emergencies. One is the pandemic, post-pandemic kind of structuring of the WHO with all these 10 points and this proposal, 10 proposals that we will look at in, in a minute. The other one is the emergencies that the WHO increasingly has to face in an increasingly turbulent world. <laughs> you know, uh, we should also a little bit separate the kind of a humanitarian emergencies you know, of Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, of course, Ukraine and uh, Ethiopia, you name it. The, the many emergencies that are uh, coming and, uh, to the fore and that have not, not been solved from the past. And then you have, of course, the, the flow of 
document production, debates that derives from COVID-19. This is the bulky thing. Has WHO, has the international community learned from COVID-19? I have my serious doubts uh, because, uh, um, first of all, we should not remember that, uh, we should never forget that, in fact, the WHO has, and the international community have entrusted two entities of private uh, jurisdiction, uh, foundations, basically, the management of COVID-19. And this has consequences in the way in which solutions are now being designed, even through the pandemic treaty, because we have to recall the fact that the pandemic treaty is something that, uh, for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation cherishes very much. Even the IFPMA, the International uh, Association of Pharmaceutical Producers, they see it as an opportunity to set the rules for the future. And there is, a, there is a, bis, a big risk that the rules of the future will be tailored according to this multi-stakeholder model, meaning that uh, all of society, all of government, uh, with uh, various actors, uh, no matter where their vested interests are, in a totally deregulated scenario. So this is, for me, from a governance perspective, uh, the, the really least promising uh, uh, arena for the future. The 10 proposals. The 10 proposals are very complex, of course, uh, you know, setting a, a pandemic scenario for the future is a complex exercise. What I think is, uh, is really worrying, if words count, is that the notion of prevention is uh, uh, literally disappeared from uh, the acronym of the uh, emerge, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response, HERP, Prevention is no longer there, which should be the first lesson of COVID-19. And also that uh, uh, there are many ambiguities and many proposals made with no specification of how they will be, be implemented, such as, for example, the health council with heads of states uh, to be placed, we don't know where, how many heads of states. The la other contradiction we I think is uh, very, really glaring is uh, how you think of uh, preparing the preparedness and response financially to the pandemic of the, fu of the future through a World Bank pandemic fund, which basically replicates uh, the weaknesses, the frailties, uh, and the inconsistencies of donor-driven financing, which has never really worked well for a single individual infectious disease. Can you imagine for a systemic exercise of even response and preparedness to the future pandemics. So there are many elements that need to be discussed and that will have to be, uh, you know, uh, questioned and investigated further. Great. Uh, so I think what you are talking about is also the structural changes which are required and health systems is strengthening also required, which we are seeing that many developing countries are talking about even when the rich countries are not really emphasizing much on that. Uh, but taking off from here, uh, you recently worked on a report for G2H2, uh, which talks about debt and the health crisis and health emergencies, that how the debt that the developing countries are in um, has impacted and will continue to impact um, everything health, be it emergencies or otherwise. Can you just talk to us and tell us a little more about your findings and uh, the drain of wealth from one side to the other, yeah. Of course, we don't yet know what the pandemic accord will be, what it will be containing, how it will be framed even, if it is going to be a framework convention, a treaty, we don't know. So uh, it's uh, a bit uh, anticipatory to now enter into these uh, projections, but what certainly will be a pillar of any agreement, binding agreements that the WHO and the international community will strike, um, is the financial part of it. Who is going to finance, who is going to support this enormous uh, uh, engagement, commitment for uh, pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. And even if they take the word prevention away, it will be a major <laughs> commitment anyway. Well, it will, cannot really uh, be a, a pandemic fund. Uh, it cannot really be something that uh, at the moment imagines a, a commitment of 10 billion per year uh, and it has only a few hundreds of million actually in the pot at the moment with 1.4 billion pledged and not seen yet. So 
you know, uh, 10 billion per year, according to this donor driven logic and this idea, which is very colonial to have uh, the countries from the south asking for money <laughs> from the countries of the north uh, is not going to make any difference in our view. You cannot really treat such a, an exercise uh, in the ordinary fashion. When you talk about health systems, there is a lot of discussions about national public funding for health. Eh? How can these countries, especially from the global south, but even more from the global north too, how can countries take the money that is required uh, by the WHO to invest in public health? And what should they do with that money? So these are two horns of the question. We know that 54 low and middle income countries uh, during the pandemic could not invest more in global health, in their health projects, I mean, facing the, the pandemic, because they had to pay their debt to creditors. We also know that if all the debt had be, of the most indebted countries had been you know, released in 2020, $40 billion would have been liberated. They would have been $300 billion if also the debt of 2021, we're talking about the two topical, yeah. you know, peak years for the pandemic yeah. had been released. So you can see the, you know, enormous gap between the 10 billion of the World Bank, which are not faintly achieved yet, and the money that could be liberated through debt cancellation. Our point in this research and in this report is that actually debt cancellation is a global health issue that you cannot rely on you know, uh, uh, postponement of the debt service as the G20 has proposed, because these are measures that don't work. Three countries only applied, two of which were refused. So <laughs> it, yes. it doesn't work. COVID is actually urging us to look out for not new solutions. 20 years ago, there was a huge campaign on debt relief on that cancellation, actually. And I think we need to resume that because the situation is getting worse by the day. It is not me saying that we are, you know, at the eve of a debt crisis of a huge, it's a huge time bomb. It's the World Bank saying this. And even we found during our research that a London School of Economics paper was proposing debt cancellation for households in the UK. So now the situation is really global. The same goes with illicit financial flows. You know, countries from the South send a lot of money to the North in this uncontrolled, unregulated uh, modalities. We needed to change this narrative. We really would like to see governments from the global South take this window of opportunity of this pandemic treaty conversation to really start asking for new rules. In other words, now I think it's a golden moment to really decide for the Global South countries whether they want to stay being donor dependent or if they want to develop a different track. And they should do so because Africa, the Africa group at the UN has managed to pass a resolution on a major tax reforms to be discussed at the global level. This is time for new rules. This is time for a new financial justice. And uh, we really needed to bring it here and stop all this, uh, you know, mantra about innovative financing mechanisms, uh, fiscal space, and all these old kind of uh, mantric uh, locutions that really don't bring any more funding to the South. And uh, I think you also indicated at some point that the way money is flowing from the South, Global South to the Global North, actually, and uh, uh, and, and how that also impacts. And <laughs> so see, it is not that the Global no, South does not have the money. One, uh, this is this actually related to debt. We should right. actually disrupt two narratives that are really glo interiorized by everyone, countries in the North and in the South. The first br narrative to be broken, debunked and deconstructed and completely dismantled is that it is the global north that gives the money to the global south. This is not true. In fact, we know that through debt, through debt payment, through uh, you know, unpaid taxes of multinational corporations in the global south, through illicit flows, through tax evasions and tax dodgings, it is actually the global south that is sending the money to the global north. 
this is the first, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it in this way, which is a bit sweeping, but I can, you know, we have numbers and figures. The report does bring numbers to demonstrate that the Marshall Plan goes from the south to the north. The second narrative that we need to break is that the countries in the global south are indebted. Well, this is a really odious debt that was uh, created in the past. It's actually a very colonial financial trap. And uh, uh, if they were indebted, countries from the global south have certainly paid that debt in so many ways, in so many fashions. But the reality today, let's face it, is that who is really indebted? Whose debt are we talking about? Once again, if you look at the climate catastrophe, the north is the northern countries, the industrialized countries, the global, the north global hemisphere is the one that is indebted towards the global south. Global south countries are paying the price of climate disasters that they have not provoked. So I think we really need to, you know, get rid of all these major narratives and really think with a reality-based approach on how we want to discuss this pandemic treaty negotiations here in Geneva. How we, which kind of lenses do we, want to, do we want to have to look at reality? In this respect, the fact that we are only looking at medicines and access to medicines, for me, is a bit of a missed opportunity. We should really widen the glance and look, of course, at access and look, of course, at equity, but develop a broader perspective that embraces the environmental aspect of the pandemic treaty that is not there yet and the financial measures that we need to uh, con we, we need to introduce in a in the pandemic treaty negotiation for the future that actually have to put financial justice right at the core of the pandemic treaty negotiation yeah thank you so much i think this was really good and one could understand uh, where are is who at the moment going wrong and how can we expand the entire perspective and bring more in. And, uh, and and at one level, the whole discussion about finances is important because be it health emergencies, be it other agenda items that WHO is discussing there, we are facing the problem of money because uh, the governments are not spending on health or they cannot. We are facing that. WHO itself is facing a different kind of a crisis. Um, so, so probably financial justice is something which is at the root it is. of it all. I, I really yeah. think it is. Yeah. And uh, of course, it is also fiscal policies. It is also the austerity measures that yes. are being implemented now. I mean, this Absolutely. is uh, yet another yeah. way to uh, leverage privatization of health, uh, marketization of health, uh, you know, the, the, the role of the private sector. So there, there is a, a very important and a rather wide spectrum of ways of looking at a financial agenda. But what I want to say, uh, if you allow me, is that after three years of this pandemic, three years after the declaration yeah. of the pandemic emergency of international concerns, now we see health systems, even the ones that exist in the north, like here in, in, in Switzerland or, or, or in Belgium or in Italy, in France, they are devastated after three years of the pandemic. Uh, all health systems, the, the, the strongest and the weakest, they are coming out of these three years in a, they really in a collapsed state. Uh, from a structural point of view, because of the burden of diseases that have not been treated and not be, really ne have been neglected for three years, and also because uh, the huge price that the health workforce has paid for uh, facing and, and, and you know, the, uh, facing the contagion of COVID-19, uh, who are now working in really desperate conditions, underpaid, uh, insufficient numbers, un un underemployment in the health structures. And those that are employed are also facing a a an important mental health issue because they have been stressed and have been under, you know, under stress for three years, no stop. So the conditions today are not the cozy conditions that we were, which were not cozy of 2019. They are really desperate conditions. The WHO has counted 84 countries in which strikes and uh, you know legal appeals have uh, taken place in the last uh, two years because of the injustices applied through the management of the COVID pandemic on the health workforce. You have strikes everywhere, in Great Britain, in France, you have in Kenya 10 days you have reported. Right yeah, you have. Yes. So yeah. we cannot 
negotiate a pandemic treaty without looking at this complex reality for which money is not the only solution, but certainly investing more in health, dedicating more you know, commitment to health would be such a beneficial uh, vision to look at how to reconstruct society after three years. Absolutely. And we also have reported before where in Italy, because of austerity measures uh, since 2008, the number of beds to treat pulmonary diseases, which is lungs related diseases, they had gone down majorly in the in public health sector. And when COVID hit, that really came to oh, hit yeah. <laughs> uh, the common people really badly. And that is when uh, Italy also had uh, a lot of Cuban doctors coming yeah, yeah. in, <laughs> helping. So all of that has happened. So of course, there is a lot of learning. The only unfortunate part is that uh, the, the international actors, the leaders at the international level are not really uh, behaving as if they have learned anything. And as Nicoletta had pointed out once before to me that the agenda of this year's EB and probably what will guide uh, the WHA in May, that looks like a pre-pandemic agenda. It does not look like as if we have gone through so much in the last three years in terms of inequity and the number of sheer devastation and death that people have faced. Uh, but hopefully the discussions will become better sometime and the civil society and activists will keep pushing for more oh, pro-people policies. Of course. And uh, thank you so much, Nicola. That's Nicoletta, why we are here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very <laughs> for much. For uh, joining us. And uh, yeah, we will keep coming back to you for more interviews and insights. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you.